Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's Mike here at Game from Scratch, today we are looking at the Godot game engine. Why are we looking at Godot? Well, that is because there is a new release of sorts. Yes, Godot 4.5 Dev 5 is here. Now, this is actually a somewhat significant dev release in that apparently this is going to be the last one. So, uh, what have we got going on here? And then we'll do a quick recap of the previous dev releases because that's going to give us an idea of exactly what we are dealing with with this Godot release. We're going to have all of the features that are going to be there for the beta, at least that's our starting point. So hopefully we'll start seeing a bit of a feature freeze, then we'll mix down towards uh, stability releases, the release candidates, and then finally Godot 4.5. So this, again, in theory, is the last of the 4.5 dev releases. And after that, we are good to go. By the way, you're seeing a sample scene right now available from a Godot pack available over on Gumroad. Five environments for $9.99. Link is down below. Make sure you use the code SN40 if you do pick it up. I, I'm just going to use it as an example for this particular scene. But truth of the matter is, we don't have a ton of hands-on graphical stuff to showcase, but we got some cool new things here. The first one we've got here is if you come into your project, and you go to export it, what you are now going to find is there is this new option called the Shader Baker. Now, this is going to make it so that your project starts up a whole lot faster on exported platforms, but at the cost of being bigger. So there's a couple of trade-offs there. We'll get to that in the release notes in just a second. But yeah, we now have this new Shader Baker available, which is pretty cool. On top of that, we also have some new um, code features here. So let's go here to the script thing, and I'm going to create a new script. So new script here and we will call this script Bob. So we got bob.gd, and what Bob is, is a new class. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new class for Bob. So let's say abstract class name Bob extends no. So this is basically a new declared class of type Bob. Now the thing is, the keyword here is abstract. Now this is like defining interfaces in C++. This is a class that you cannot implement yourself. It is there to provide an interface for other classes to extend. So let's go ahead and show an example of that. So we've got Bob here. So now what I'm going to do is come in here and do another new script, and we will call it this son of Bob, like so. And this will inherit, well, it's going to start off inheriting node, but what we're going to do is replace that. So what we're going to do here is call this class name son of Bob extends Bob. All right, so there you go. Boom. All right, and now what we're going to do is go ahead and use some kind of example script. So let's say we were using Bob and son of Bob. We'll just attach it here. So attach a new script uh, to our, our root node here. So new node 3D. Uh, and then we'll do in, actually, I'll do it right here. So what I could do is say uh, var um, Bob Villa, and then equals, and then the kicker here is what I want to do is a Bob not new. But the minute I do that, what you're going to find is cannot construct abstract class Bob. And that's the entire idea behind abstract classes. You cannot interface or implement them correct uh, or uh, cor uh, <laughs> uh, directly. So what you've got to do is inherit another class from it. So again, it is a way of defining an interface or a template for other classes and other things to use. So your code can be kind of universal on things that implement from that abstract class, but you can't actually implement an abstract class. But what we can do is implement son of Bob. And that is perfectly fine. I ignore this part over here. Uh, it's just the nature of how I set things up. So that is one of the new features here as well. Another cool thing we've got here is var my color equals uh, and then we could do color, and then what you're going to notice there, immediately when I started, we got that little picker to the left-hand side of it. So now let's say I was going to do this as red, so 0, 0, 1. So there we go, red. Now let's say I was going to do 50% transparency, and you'll notice that transparency immediately shows up. The cool thing about this new picker is you could also come in here, and I could have just gone uh, like this and emptied that like so, and then just gone ahead and said, okay, I want to make it this color with this alpha, and it'll fill in all the values for you. It's just a little quality of life thing, uh, but it is a high quality quality of life thing, at least in my humble opinion. So those are kind of some of the new features directly here. There's one more, and I got to be kind of honest with this. I don't see a ton of detail difference. So let's go ahead. Uh, we will stop this. Let's detach my script just in case uh, I still have that running. So detach that script. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead. We'll run this scene. Here we go. And here is our scene as it stands right now. So I'll just kind of fly around. I already set up a little moving camera on our scene. So this is what things look like 
with the current settings. All right, and again, I honestly don't see much of a difference on this one. So there it is as the world stands now. And then what you'll notice here is if we go into project, project settings, anti-aliasing, and then screen space anti-aliasing. Right now we have it set to none. We have a new one, which is SMAA, and we'll turn that one on. So this should be better, it does better edging than FXAA does, and this should give us better anti-aliasing. So that is the other new rendering feature here. There's a couple of other new things I can't showcase to you that easily, and here you can see it running. Now again, I, I'm not noticing a ton of difference, but then again, I'm not really, uh, except for temporal anti-aliasing, it doesn't tend to jump out at me all that much personally. Uh, but yeah, that is the difference. By the way, once again, this scene uh, is available in part of a bundle that is going away very shortly. So let's just stop that down and let's head on over and check out the release notes on this one. So this is Godot 4.5 Dev 5. This actually came out a couple of days ago. It's been a busy week with a lot of announcements. So that's why we're a little late on this one. But you can go ahead and check this one out. Again, we've got Dev 1, 2, 3, and 4 already released. And the key thing here is what it says up here, it is upon us, not yet, but this is likely to be our final development snapshot of the 4.5 release cycle. So after that, we should move on into the beta time frame, and then feature freeze, and then hopefully that is more or less what we can expect from Godot 4.5. So what do we have here? Well, this first announcement is going to make six people in the world happy, and that is there is now native Vision OS support. Uh, it's a really cool product. It's just like for four grand, nobody bought it, or at least majority of people didn't buy it. But for those of you that actually did buy uh, Vision OS, you want to develop games in uh, Godot, you can do so. So, hey, you got something else to do with the, your expensive device over there. Uh, and then we've got uh, GDScript, again, the abstract class. I showed you this in action earlier on. So you can't directly instantiate the an, an abstract class, but a class that inherits from an abstract class, like what you see here, works perfectly fine. Again, it's a way of defining code interfaces, more or less. An abstract class basically says, this is what will be implemented, but it can't implement itself. So then whatever extends it is responsible for implementing that interface. Then again, we do have that shader baker. So this will, uh, shader baker is strongly recommended when targeting Apple devices or direct 3d 12, since it makes the biggest difference there. And we're talking a uh, 20 times decrease in load times in the TPS demo. There is of course the cost of it. So here you can see, uh, the before loading, uh, and then you see the speed of the loading. And yeah, it's, it's, it's not really that. Actually, I don't even know if this is animated. Oh, it actually is animated. It is very slow. And then otherwise, boom, very, very fast. So again, 20 times faster from when you click play to when it's actually loaded. Again, I'm not 100% certain this is actually going to end. Uh, but huge speed times, but there are trade-offs. So export times will be much longer. Nobody really generally cares too much there because uh, it's one of those things you just do when you deploy your game. Not a big deal. However, your build size will be much larger since it's baking the shaders and those all take up space. So there is a trade-off here uh, and it only works with the forward plus renderer uh, on the Intel Max and baking for Vulkan can be done from any device, but baking for Direct3 to 12 needs to be done from a Windows device and baking for Apple needs to be done for from a metal uh, compiler. So one of those limitations. Uh, we also have support for WIM, or web uh, SIMD. Uh, so I think that's single instruction, multiple data. It's a way that basically chips have been designed since like the 60s. Uh, it's sort of a multitasking process of having uh, a whole bunch of uh, data. It, it, go look it up. I'm going to do a very poor job of explaining it. Uh, but it kind of gives you, it's not... Uh, multi-threading per se, but it gives you some of the advantages. You should get uh, better speed, uh, better parallel processing capabilities on web builds. Uh, so SIMD support is now available. I would look that one up. Again, we have the inline color picker. We saw that in action earlier on. And then we've got the rendering goodies. Again, I let's just zoom in and we'll look. So this is uh, SMAA off on. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I honestly, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to see in terms of the difference. If you see the difference that I don't, please let me know. Uh, I don't see it. And then same here, off, on, off, on. Again, I'm not really seeing it other than maybe a little bit of the jaggy edges on this bridge over here. Jaggy edges on this guy. But again, 
I don't particularly see it. Maybe you do more. Uh, and then another one that we do have that is quite cool is there's now support for bent normal maps. Now, bent normal maps need to be created in a tool, something like Substance Designer. Blender can be set up to do it. Uh, there's Gnald, the texture tool, and a bunch of other things. And there's basically a normal map with extra detail in it. So you can have kind of ambient occlusion data, et cetera, baked into the normals. Uh, and you can see the results of it right here. Um, and then over here, we got another example. This one is a little bit more visible in terms of the results, although your source assets need to have uh, the normals built in. Otherwise, you basically create your normal maps using bent normals instead of normal normals, and it will just work. So you can get a little bit more detail in it. Um, so if you're looking, if you want to learn a little bit more about this, look up specifically uh, about bent normal maps and what they do. So they bring in, they enhance spe specular occlusion and indirect lighting support across normals by basically just encoding a little bit more data into the normal map data. And then we have a number of other smaller fixes and improvements, etc. So a hundred, total of 109 contributors and 252 fixes in this release. And that's kind of what we are looking at from this release. But keep in mind, there is also the Dev4 release which had uh, starting support for C-sharp on web platforms, the embedded window support for Mac OS, uh, the 3D physics interpolation was moved to the scene tree, variants can now be exported, stackable outlines and shadows on labels, and specular occlusions from ambient light. And then in Dev3, we have uh, screen reader support, uh, new script backtracing support, inspector section toggling, uh, which I love, by the way. So we'll just quickly go back and showcase that one. So let's say here in my world environment, if I am using something, it shows up as, but see here, not using volumetric fog or glow. I'll say if I want to start using glow, I turn glow on. And then what you'll notice is then, boom, the tree is expandable and so on. Turn glow off. None of the sub options are there. This is a chef's kiss. Uh, just a quality of life feature, but probably one of my favorites that we're going to expect in Godot 4.5. And then a number of other small fixes and improvements. Dev 2, we saw the dedicated 2D nav server, a reorganized shader editor UI, a Editor languages no longer require restart when you change them. Uh, fragment density map support or foveated rendering for VR. Wayland support on Linux uh, and then other small improvements. And then in Dev 1, you've got the ability to mute game and uh, multiple selections inside of the game window. Uh, collision system for tile map layers. This one is a huge deal. If you're doing 2D tile maps, this one is worth the cost of... Um, admission alone. And then we got drag and drop of resource UID. So those are the features, the hierarchy feature or the, the marquee features in uh, Godot 4.5 uh, as it stands. I think 4.4 is going to shape it up to be a better release, but some nice things coming in 4.5. And is there anything in there that you are particularly excited to see? By the way, once again, the asset we saw in action here is coming from Star Nova. I don't know how much longer this is going to be run. It's been running for a month or two now at this point in time. But if you do buy it, again, make sure you use the code SN40. Drops 40 bucks off. It makes this a 9.99 bundle. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is is it Godot 4.5 Dev 5, the theoretical last of the dev releases. So we now more or less know what to expect in Godot 4.5. Let me know what you think. Comments down below. I'll talk to you all later. Goodbye.